Welcome back to the channel everyone. I am the Pop Culture Mechanic and today we're going to be talking about Marvel. Yes, Marvel. Marvel Entertainment, Marvel Comics, Marvel Universe, Marvel Movies, Marvel, Ms. Marvel, Ms. Marvel, Captain Marvel, Captain Marvel. Whoops, wrong one. Okay, Marvel Comics is lucky to be around and I'm going to tell you why. Let's step into our time machine and go back to the year 1936. Martin Goodman was a publisher of pulp magazines in 1936. He released his first called Kazar. It was like a Tarzan knockoff. In 1938, he created a science fiction magazine with the title Marvel Science Stories, which later became Marvel Tales. In 1939, a sales manager from a company called Funnies talked Mr. Goodman into publishing comics. He called his first comic book line Timely Publications, and his first comic had a cover date of October 1939 and was named Marvel Comics No. 1. Martin Goodman hired writer and artist Joe Simon from Funnies, Inc. to be Timely's first editor-in-chief. Later on, he hired Jack Kirby as an artist, and lastly, he hired his wife's cousin to be an office assistant, and his name was Stanley Lieber. In the beginning, he was a gopher for Simon and Kirby, but his dream was to be a writer, and fortunately, Joe Simon gave him a chance. In Captain America issue No. 3, where he wrote under the pen name, Stan Lee. In 1941, World War II had already been going on for two years. Germany had attacked Poland, so France, Britain, and her colonies had declared war on the Axis, which was comprised of Germany, Italy, and Japan. America was neutral and wanted nothing to do with another war in Europe, as people remembered the horrors of the First World War. But the team at Timely recognized that Nazism was a threat to all countries, and seeing as how they already had the Submariner fighting them, they decided to create a new character who stood for liberty and freedom, and that was Captain America. They made a big splash having him socking Hitler in the face on the cover of Captain America Comics No. 1, and America was not even fighting in the war yet. When that fateful attack happened on December 7, 1941, that was the call to arms for many people, including the ones at Timely Comics. Joe Simon had enlisted in the Coast Guard, and Jack Kirby went into the Army. Stanley Lieber, who was editor-in-chief after Simon had left, joined the army as well, choosing the Signal Corps to serve in. Timely was left to a man named Vince Fago for the duration. So while the main group of creatives at Timely were off serving their country, their creations were rolling right along. Captain America, the Human Torch, and the Submariner were as popular as ever, and although no new superhero characters were being created, Timely was trying to diversify its lineup and attract other audiences with comics like Super Rabbit, and Miss America, a heroine designed for young girls. At the theaters in 1944, Timely's first movie made its debut. The Captain America movie serial was released in 15 installments, and after this there would not be another film adaptation until 1966 with the Marvel Superheroes television series. It was produced by Republic Pictures and was the most expensive movie serial at that time for the studio. Timely was trying to win more female readers and switch from developing a female heroine to a more realistic series for the girls they hoped to attract. So Miss America Comics was revamped and featured a girl named Patsy Walker as the main character, and Miss America was soon dropped from her own comic. Patsy Walker would go on to star in comics for the next 20 years. By 1945, the war was ending, and with it, the appeal of superheroes began to wane. A lot of soldiers who were reading them overseas were now back home and had more important things to do, like get civilian jobs and start families. Comics were seen to be for kids, and these returning soldiers were no longer kids. Timely was still chasing after new readers, specifically girls, so another character joined Patsy Walker, and her name was Millie the Model, and she debuted in her own comic and was a big hit right up until the 1960s. At this time, Stanley Lieber returned as well and resumed his duties as Timely Editor-in-Chief. He found there was that new line of comics aimed at girls with female lead characters and topics aimed at them. In 1946, Gene Colan was hired by Stanley Lieber to be a staff penciler. He would go on to be one of Timely's best artists and get to work on books like Daredevil, The Invincible Iron Man, and Submariner. 1947 came along and the name Timely had not really caught on in the public eye. Martin Goodman had removed it from the cover of his comics, but had not really come up with a permanent replacement. He had tried a corner logo that read a Marvel magazine, then tried a circular logo that read Marvel Comic, but he dropped that as well. Due to the falling popularity of Hero Comics, which had been Timely's forte, they no longer could distinguish themselves from other comics publishers, 
And so with this lack of creativity, the company formerly known as Timely would for now end up following trends rather than making them. Moving into genres like crime, romance, and westerns had helped the company to survive in 1948. It was producing titles aimed at girls like Sun Girl, the sea beauty Namora, and Venus, the goddess of love. Having moved offices during World War II, they were now located on the 14th floor of the Empire State Building. All the artists worked together in one large room, people such as Carl Burgos, John Bushima, Gene Colan, Dan DiCarlo, Mike Sikowski, and the supervisor Sid Shores. They referred to this area as the bullpen for a short time, which as some of you might know was picked up again in the 1960s. This flurry of activity was good for the company, however, they did not see the approaching storm as the 1940s came to an end. What was this storm? This storm was the public's negative reaction to comic books. The books were called subliterary junk and blamed for juvenile delinquency. The person leading the charge for this was Dr. Frederick Wortham, who had written about them in the Saturday Review of Literature in 1948. There were even public comic book burnings in some towns in America. The company formerly known as Timely did run an editorial response to these wild accusations, but this fell on deaf ears as the American public had made up its mind and Congress had taken notice of this and would start their own investigation in the 1950s. During the war, there had been paper rationing, so Martin Goodman had to maximize his profits on each issue that used up a portion of his paper allocation. Now that the war was long over and rationing was stopped, he was free to pump out as much as he could, and he did. He literally choked the racks full with comics. This led to quantity over quality, and his strategy of just following the trends until they burnt out reigned supreme. During the Korean War in 1951, the new trend was war comics with an anti-communist message, and the company loaded up the newsstands with them. Also popular was weird horror comics, and surprisingly, they had good writing and great artistry, along with some self-deprecating humor. These comics also began to credit their artists and turn them into celebrities to their fans. Finally, at the end of the year, Martin Goodman launched his own distribution network. It was named Atlas, and this was the name and logo he would put on his comic books from now on. Well, until he changed his mind again. With nothing holding him back, Martin Goodman unleashed 400 titles over the year onto the marketplace. This was an all-time high, and numbers like that would not be seen again until the 1990s. Atlas just barged its way onto the shelves and just through sheer numbers was establishing itself in the minds of Americans. It looked as if the anti-comic book people were rearing their ugly heads again in 1953. The horror genre had been pushing the limits of what could be written and drawn. Day by day, more articles were being printed in publications that were against comics. They said that the comics were bad for children and ruined young eyes. Once again, Frederick Wortham was leading the charge, and he had his own book coming out later, titled Seduction of the Innocent. This book claimed that reading comics was turning children into delinquents, and the parents' magazines were taking excerpts from his book and publishing them for the public to read and drum up interest in his book. The entire comic industry was trying to fight back with arguments that the readers were smart enough to differentiate between fantasy and reality, but the public had made up their minds, and now the government had taken notice. Atlas tried to resurrect their superhero line in 1954, but that didn't last long as they were cancelled by the end of the year. So they just introduced new titles and removed ones that were not making them any money. There were new westerns like Western Outlaws and Arrowhead. There were jungle comics like Jungle Tales and Jungle Action. Military comics like Navy Action and Marines in Battle. Adventure and crime titles named Police Action and Spy Thrillers. Still, public opinion kept turning against the comic industry. Dr. Wortham's book had been released, and the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency had started their investigation into the issue. In order to take the heat off the industry, all the publishers got together as the Comics Magazine Association of America and formed the Comics Code Authority. The CCA would create a code of ethics for comic books and review the upcoming releases to see that they would conform to the new rules. This seemed to placate the public and the government, but there was a downside. The words horror and weird had been banned, and EC Comics, which had used such words in their titles, went out of business. The talent that had been there had to look for work elsewhere. The advantage to Atlas was that there was less competition on the racks. All Atlas had to do was tone down their content, and they easily passed the Comic Code Authority scrutiny. The Silver Age of Comics started in 1956. Over at DC, they had brought back some of their superheroes with a fresh new design and origin stories. 
Over at Atlas, things continued on as normal. The Senate hearings, public perception of comic books, and television did have a negative impact on comic sales. So Martin Goodman did what he was good at and cut costs by paying his artists less. Usually they would bring their work in and be offered more work, but at a reduced rate. So by the end of the year, they had earned half as much as they did in the beginning. This led to artists quitting and finding work elsewhere, mostly in advertising. Atlas had no idea what was coming in 1957. In order to save more money and not have to pay overhead on his own distribution company, Martin Goodman signed a deal with American News. This would increase his circulation due to American News having 1,500 retail outlets. What Goodman didn't realize was that American News had their own problems, like their sellers deserting the firm and being investigated for running a monopoly and having mob connections. When Dell, their largest client, decided not to renew their contract with American News and sued them for restraint of trade, that was too much for American News, and they shut down and left publishers, including Atlas, without any distribution. Now Goodman had to scramble to get his books distributed. He told Stanley Lieber to stop buying new work. Artists like John Romita, Joe Sinnott, and Dick Ayers were told to turn in any completed work and there would be no more assignments for them. The situation was dire, and Goodman had to turn to his direct competition, which was Independent News, which was the distribution arm of national periodical publications, known today as DC Comics. Goodman could continue to get his comics and magazines out to the public, except now there were restrictions placed upon him. Now, for a man who would flood the market whenever he saw a popular trend, this was humiliating, as they would only allow him to publish eight titles a month. He instead decided to publish 16 titles bi-monthly to maximize profits. Atlas also lost its name as it was replaced with the independent news moniker. This seemed to be the darkest time in history for Goodman's company. He was left to run his company at the whim of his competition. Now the company formerly known as Atlas was pared down to a leaner version. Stanley Lieber was able to concentrate more on the few titles that were left and able to do more writing. I think more out of necessity than anything else. Any writing he couldn't do, he farmed out to his brother Larry Lieber. Anyone who was left over after the purge was now part of a tight group of artists and writers that would lead the company into the next year. This group included Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Don Heck, Larry Lieber, Paul Reinman, Stan Goldberg, Al Hartley, and Dick Ayers. At the end of 1959, the company had stabilized, but was a shell of its former glory. Now it was just barely able to maintain profitability. All Goodman could do was follow the trends going into the 1960s. And although they had dropped the Atlas name, Goodman would use different corporate entities to take advantage of tax laws that favored small publishers. Independent News loosened up the restrictions in 1961, and Goodman was able to publish 9 to 12 books a month. To this end, Goodman saw that superheroes were making a comeback. As the story goes, he was out golfing with some executive at DC Comics. The guy was bragging about how his book starring a group of superheroes was flying off the shelves. Upon hearing this, Goodman went back and told Stanley Lieber to create their own superhero team and fast. Lieber came up with the Fantastic Four. They wanted these new heroes to be more realistic and have the faults of regular people, something the average reader could relate to. It took about nine months for the figures to be finalized, but Goodman finally learned that the Fantastic Four was a smash hit with readers who flooded the office with fan letters. This encouragement is what Stanley Lieber needed to pursue more superhero comics, such as Spider-Man, Thor, Iron Man, the Avengers, and the X-Men. Finally, in 1963, the company decided to establish a new brand name and finally called itself Marvel and introduced the Marvel corner box art on all its covers. This was truly the beginning of the Marvel age of comics, and that is why Marvel is lucky to be around to this day. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning about the history of Marvel. All the information presented here I got from reading the Marvel Year by Year A Visual Chronicle book. Thank you for taking time to watch the video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe.